you want to ask that the Lord himself will speak to you, that will not be dull of hearing, but that the word of God we are going to hear today will do us good. That we are going to benefit from the efficacy of the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Christ. That blood will do something in your life today. You want to tell the Lord, do it, Lord. Speak to me through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you for the privilege you've given to us to come into your word as we come to the end of our worship service of today. I pray that as we are going to open the passages of the scriptures, Lord, you will speak your word to every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. I pray that the efficacy of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross will be beneficial to everyone hearing the sound of my voice here today in Jesus' name. That this word we are going to hear, Lord, will do us good. And will not be dull of hearing, but that, Lord, you give us the grace to comprehend all the things you are going to teach us from your word. And that we will not just hear and know these things, but that, Lord, this word will be applicable in our lives even today in Jesus' name. That through the word we are going to hear today, we will receive strength to go all the way with our Lord in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because I know you've had an answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Shall we receive her, please? Today, we come back to the text we've considered during the time of our Sajjah Scriptures. And we're going to consider from verses 22 to 31 of Numbers chapter 15. And the title of our message today is The Unblemished Lamp of God for Our Eternal Redemption. The Unblemished, the Lamp without any stain. The lamb that was provided by God himself. And that lamb is for our eternal redemption. That's one thing I want you to know. We are talking about the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And the sacrifice of Christ because he is the unblemished lamb of God is for our eternal redemption. Let's go to our text, and then I begin to explain some things for us. From verse 22 of Numbers chapter 15, verse 22. And if ye have heard and not observed all these commandments, which the Lord has spoken unto Moses, let's just stop there. The words we are hearing today is not the words of Moses. It's not the words of any founder of religion. It's not even the words of me, your local pastor here. It says, these are the commandments. These are the words. These are the instructions that the Lord has spoken unto Moses. That's what I want you to always see in your life, that whenever we are hearing the words of God, even the words sometimes can come to you directly. Even the pastor or the minister can speak the word of God to you, and that word is pointing out some things in your life, some things you need to make amend of. My brother, don't see it as the words of the pastor. 
Don't see it as the words of a general superintendent. Don't see it as the words of a regional overseer. Don't see it as the words of any minister of God. See that word coming to you directly as the very word of God. And then he says, if ye hear and not observe. You see there that we hear, we transgress, we sin if we don't observe the words of God, the commandments of God. It is not enough to hear like we are hearing now. Yes, we can. We've been hearing a lot in our church here. We've been hearing a lot in all the things the Lord has been speaking to us through our Father and the Lord as well. But it is not enough to hear. We must observe. We must do. That's why it says, ye hear. You do wrong if you don't observe and to do the commandments of the Lord. In verse 23, it says, Even all that the Lord has commanded you by the hand of Moses, from the day the Lord commanded Moses, and henceforth among your generations, that it shall be, if all be command committed by ignorance, without the knowledge of the congregation, without the knowledge of the congregation, the pastor may not know, the church may not know, but always know that there is nothing that escapes, escapes the eyes of our own seeing God. He sees everything, even the thing you do at the darkest of night, even the things you do when others are not there, the things you do when the pastor is not there, the things you do when your wife or your husband is not there. He says, without the knowledge, you do that thing, yet it, that thing does not escape the knowledge of our omniscient God. He knows all things, and it will bring everything into judgment. That's why he says in that verse 24, then it shall be if all be committed by ignorance without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall offer one young bullock for a burnt offering, for a sweet savor unto the Lord, with his meat offering and his drink offering, according to the manner and one kid of the goat for a sin offering. Let's just stop there. The sin of an individual can affect the whole congregation. That's why we should be careful what we do with our life. That's why we should be careful what we allow in our family. The sin of a, any member of that family can destroy that family, can destroy the whole church. That's why God says, even though he committed that sin ignorantly, yet the whole congregation, there is no room for excuse in the sight of God. There is no room to say, oh, I don't know in the sight of God. Once the Lord points that thing out in your life, in the church, or in your family, there is need for repentance. That's what thing we are learning here. It says the whole congregation we offer the offering of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Then in verse 25, and it says, and the priest shall make an atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel. 
and it shall be forgiven them, for it is ignorance, ignorance, and they shall bring their offering, a sacrifice made by fire unto the Lord, and their sin offering before the Lord for their ignorance. He said, they will bring it. The priest shall make an atonement. What do you see there? The priest shall make. It is not the offerer that will make the, the atonement. It is the priest that will make the atonement. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Rock of ages, clear for me. It is not what we offer. It is not what we do that gives the remission of our sin, that pays the price for the redemption of our sin. It is what our high priest, the one greater than the ironic priesthood, it is what he has done for us on the cross of Calvary that gives the redemption. The priest here, you know, says he will make the atonement. Even though you come with the sacrifice, even though you bring all the offerings, yet the atonement is left for the priest to make. What things are we learning from here also? Brethren, there are some things you cannot toy with in the household of faith. There are some steps, some boundaries you must not step in the household of God. There are some things that God himself has ordained in his house for decency and for, you know, for orderliness and the organization of his church that we, we need to learn from here. And we need to allow the priests of the Lord to take up their responsibilities in doing what the Lord expects them to do. That's another thing we're also learning from here. Then we're also learning here that every sacrifice we made unto God, everything you offer unto God, you don't just offer unto the Lord half-heartedly. You don't just offer unto the Lord and your mind is not there. And you don't think about that offering. And there is no zeal in that offering. There is nothing you are giving unto the Lord with, with excitement. He says that sacrifice must be made by faith. Fire. There must be the Z there. There must be the, 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 the passion there as you give your offering unto the Lord. It's not just money. Yes, money is, is important. It's not just, you know, I give my tithe and offering. You can give your tithe and offering, and yet yeah, that offering is not by fire. You're just giving it away, you know, grudgingly. That's why he says, the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. Anything we give unto the Lord, any sacrifice we give unto the Lord, it must be made by fire. There must be passion in it. There must be the zeal. There must be the love in it. You give that thing. Are you giving your time? You don't give it grudgingly. Are you giving your service unto the Lord? Like our brother was teaching us during the time of the summary that the Sabbath is meant for service and for sustainability. Yes, you give your service unto the Lord. I'm asking you, do you give it with fire, with the zeal, with passion? Are you thoughtful? Do you give everything? You bring your intelligence into that offering. You bring everything you have, your knowledge, your skill, into that offering. You come to sing, yeah, you sing with passion. You come to offer unto the Lord any service in the house. You come to worship the Lord like on Sunday, like this. You don't just come half heartedly. You don't just come and your mind is not here. You don't just come and you are thinking, oh, when will the service finish? Okay, they'll finish by five. 
when they finish by five, I'm going to work. I need to do, you know, pastor, hurry up, you know, uh, the choir. Please sing well, sing quickly, you know, be do everything quickly. And your heart is not here. You're, you are thoughtless of your service. You are thoughtless of your worship. That sacrifice is not acceptable in the, uh, in the, uh, in the sight of the Lord. That's why the Lord is reminding us today that as we come here, as we come to worship, as we come to give our time, as we come to give our offering, our sacrifice, everything we give must be made by fire. There must be zeal in it. You offer your service unto the Lord because he first loved you and he gave himself unto you. You want to give yourself unto him as well, totally, wholeheartedly, with zeal, with passion, with commitment, and the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Then in verse 26, he says, And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel and the stranger that sojourned among them, seeing all the people were in ignorance. Let's just stop there. You see another thing we are learning from here? The sacrifice of the Lord is for all. The offering of Calvary is for all. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. Both the Jews and the Gentiles are included in the forgiveness of our God. Both those, you know, who, the outsiders and the insiders, they are all accepted in the presence of the Lord. But that's why we need to understand that the God we are serving, the God we are worshiping, is the God that loves the whole world. The same thing we need to also understand. Then in verse 27, it says, And if any soul sin through ignorance, then he shall bring a she-goat of the first year, of the first year, of the first year for his sin offering, for his sin offering. And you see in that verse 28, it says, And the priest again shall make an atonement for the soul that sinned ignorantly, when he sinned by ignorance before the Lord, to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. In verse 29, ye shall have one law for him that sinned through ignorance, both for him that is born among the children of Israel, and for the stranger that sojourned among them. Everyone included. One law for this uh, uh, color people, the another law for another color. No, the law of God is universal. The love of God is universal. The provision of Calvary is universal. The promises of God are inclusive for everyone. For everyone. And it's not based on your color. It's not based on your tribe. It's not based on your position. It's not based on what you have. It's not based on your educational skill. The promises of God, the provisions of God, they are for all. And I pray that every one of us here today will, will benefit in his provision in Jesus' name. Can I hear a louder amen? Look at verse 30 now. But the soul that doeth all presumptuously. The soul, the soul that he, he premeditate that thing before he does it. The soul that thing and say, well, I know this is evil, but I'm still going to do it deliberately. We fully, he says in verse 30, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, that same will prosecute the Lord. That same, he will push the Lord. Then that soul, he says, what will happen to that soul? And that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandments, that soul will be utterly cut off. His iniquity 
shall be upon him. I pray that will not be you in Jesus' name. Whatever the sin, there is a sacrifice that is demanded, that is required by God in the Old Testament. But for us, under the New Testament dispensation, we have the sacrifice that have been made by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the unblemished lamb. God demanded for the children of Israel, they need to provide the she goat of the first year. But for us today, we have the sacrifice, the unblemished lamp of God. That's why we are considering this message, the unblemished lamp of God for our eternal redemption. It is the, he is the unblemished lamp of God. John, the, uh, John, the forerunner talked about it in John chapter 1. Open your Bible with me to John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, Jesus seeth, the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God. He was the Lamb that was shed, that was sacrificed, offered. On the cross at Calvary, behold the lamp of God, which taketh away the sin of the old world. Which taketh away the sin of the old world. He died. He paid the price. He took away the punishment. That's redemption in an exchange of eternal life of God. He bore the penalty of our sin so that we can receive the eternal life from God. Redemption. He redeemed. He bought back. He restored unto us the life of God that was lost at the garden of Eden. And this redemption, look at what the Bible talks about him in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 1, it says, In whom we have redemption, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. In whom we have redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace in him. We have that redemption. In him, he paid the price, the penalty of our sin. In Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, it says, Neither by the blood of goats, like we saw in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was by the blood of goat, the she goat. They had their sin offering given unto the Lord. That the, the high priest, the priest can make the atonement for their sin. It says, but for us today, under the New Testament dispensation, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, by his own blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, he entered in once into the holy place, Having obtained eternal, do you see that word there? Eternal redemption for us. Having obtained the price Christ paid on the cross of Calvary for the forgiveness of our sin, for the redemption of our soul is eternal. There is no other sacrifice needed again. It is the first and the final sacrifice acceptable unto God for the redemption of our soul. He paid the sacrifice. He paid the price in verse 14. In verse 14, it says there, How much more shall the blood of Christ, you see it again, the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, the unblemished lamp of God for our eternal redemption. The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot, unblemished, without stain, unblemished, to God, purge your conscience from dead works 
to serve the living God. From dead wars to serve the living God in verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death is death on the cross for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. They which are called, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal redemption or eternal inheritance. In verse 22, and almost all things whereby the law poured with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no justification. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of our sin. But Christ shed this blood. Christ paid the price so that you and I can receive that eternal redemption, the forgiveness of our sin, and the eternal inheritance in heaven with our God Almighty. I pray the Lord we do this in our lives in Jesus' name. That's why A.T. Pelsin says, It is by faith we are taken into Christ, made at once safe from holy wrought against sin, and kept safe from all perils and penalty. He, our divine Redeemer, becomes to us the new sphere of harmony and unity with God and his law, with his life and his holiness. This redemption of Christ, if it has not been fulfilled in your life, or if you have received the first benefit of his redemption, I am praying that today you, you will receive the second benefit. That second benefit that will make you holy, righteous, pure, and, and purified before God. The Lord will do it in your life today in Jesus' name. And sin will not have any hold in your life again in Jesus' name. For better understanding of our message today, we are going to consider this under priest of Eden. As we look at Numbers chapter 15, from verse 22 to 31. From verses 22 to 24, you see there the description and the pollution of sin. The description. You see how the Bible, even in the Old Testament, describes sin. What is sin? What is transgression? What is iniquity? It describes it there in verses 22 and to verse 24, and the pollution of sin. Number two, we'll see the divine provision of our sin offering. The divine provision of our sin offering. That you see from verses 25 to 29. The priests are to make atonement by the provision of the she goat that the offerer came with. But for us today, what does that signify? We'll see the divine provision. What Christ has provided for us. Because he is our sin offering. And everything, I'm praying for you today, that everything Christ has provided through his offering on the cross at Calvary, you, you will partake in all those things in Jesus' name. Then lastly, before we pray, you see that from verses 30 to 31, the damnation and punishment for all sinners. The damnation, you see that also from verses 35 to 36, that individual there, how he receive his instant judgment when he disobey the commandment of the Lord. I pray that will not be you. 
the Lord, that's why we need the benefit of this eternal redemption that Christ has paid for us on the cross so that we, we will not partake of that damnation, of that punishment that awaits all those that refuse the offering of our Lord Jesus Christ. That will not be you in Jesus' name. Let's go straight to point one here, the description and the pollution of sin. Numbers chapter 15, from verses 22 to 24. There are three things I want to point out for you as we look at that point one. Number one, you'll see the description of sin. How do we describe sin? What is sin? You see it there. Number two, we see the defilement through sinfulness. The defilement through sinfulness. And lastly, we'll see the deadness of sinners. The deadness of sinners. Let's go straight to number one here. The description of sin. Numbers chapter 15, verse 22 to 23 and verse 31. It says, and if ye have heard, if ye have heard, sin is the doing. Sin is hearing. You know, when you sin, you hear. When you sin, what does it mean to hear? To hear means to do the wrong. Do you understand? Oh, I have way. What does that mean? I have done that which is wrong. And that's the definition of sin. In accordance to the Bible, to sin against God is to err against God. To do contrary to his commandment. To do contrary. That's why he says, if ye have err and not observe, and not observe. That's sin. That's the description of sin there. You sin when you don't observe the commandment of God. The commandment of God in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In fact, Christ, he condensed the old commandment of God into two. And what is that? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. With what? With some? I love God, I love God, but this thing is demanding for me my time. This job is demanding my knowledge and everything I have. So because of that, I need to rationalize my love for God. You hear, my brother. You hear, my sister. Because the commandment of the Lord is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all, not some, with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy strength, everything you are. Everything you ever be belongs unto God. And you will love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That's the commandment of the Lord. And it says, the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as what? As thyself. Do you do that? That's the commandment of the Lord. That's the commandment of the Lord. You know, last Sunday, by the grace of God, our Father in the Lord, and I think I've sent the outlines to you as well in the church here. I gave us the outline. Our Father in the Lord did something in the church last Sunday in Bagada. He went from Matthew to the Revelation, the New Testament, and he brought out some of the specific commandments of God. And I'm asking you, have you done that, my brother? Can you look at those things and you say, in my life, I've done these things. The Bible says, if not, then you hear when you observe not. You see when you observe not 
all these commandments. That's the description of sin. You know, when you understand sin that way, my brother, when you understand sin that way, my sister, your walk with God will be strengthened. Your walk, your understanding of God will be strengthened. Look at it. This is in the Old Testament. You, hey, when you observe, no, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Do you still do that? Do you still tell others about Jesus? Or you keep your faith to yourself? You keep the gospel to yourself? You err when you do not observe these commandments of the Lord. Love ye one another as I have loved you, says Christ. And how did Christ love us? He loved us sacrificially. He loved us selflessly. He loved us, you know, you know, it was a love that was selfless, a love that was sacrificial, a love that was sustaining. Do you love one another in the fellowship of God's children like that? You err when you don't observe all the commandments of the Lord, of the Lord, of the Lord. Pray ye for one another. When last do you call that brother and say, but what's your prayer request? Let's pray together. Sister, what's your prayer request? Let's pray together. You err when you don't observe all the commandments. It's not just coming to church. It's not just I'm born again, I'm born again. It's more than that, the description of sin. Look at this is Old Testament. This is the Bible. You hear when you don't observe all the commandments of the Lord. And be not bitter among yourself. Do you have bitterness against that brother, against that sister. You hear when you don't observe all the commandments of the Lord. Is there an individual in the church you don't see eye to eye with? You hear when you don't over. You can say whatever your name, whatever the title, whatever thing you do in the household of faith, you hear when you don't observe all the commandments of the Lord. These are the things the Lord is saying. We need to understand what is seen. What is seen? The description of sin. Then in verse 31, you see there in verse 31, the description of sin, it says there, because he has despised, despised the word of God. That's sin. That's sin. When you despise the word of God, as the word of God is coming to you now, my brother, as the word of God is coming to you now, my sister, do you despise the word of God? Or do you even despise the messenger of the world? Who is speaking? Oh, Pastor, I don't know. No, 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 no. He, knows, he knows how to talk. And you despise the minister. And you despise the messenger of the word of God. The Bible says, you hear when you do that. It says, because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. You see, sin there again, when you break the commandment of the Lord, that is sin. The word of God, you know that word. And you say, this one, oh, this one, no, I will break this law. This is not for me. That is sin, my brother. That is sin, my sister. When you break the commandment of the Lord, you see, and there's consequence for that. That soul shall be utterly cut off. It's iniquity. God now calls it is iniquity. Sin. Sin is iniquity. Sin is iniquity. What is sin? Let me show you this in Proverbs. Let's go to Psalm 50. Psalm, Psalm 50, verse 16. But unto the wicked, God say, What hast thou to do to declare my status? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in my mouth, in thy mouth, in thy mouth. What is sin? 
Look at verse 17. See thou eatest instruction and casted my word behind thee. God calls you a wicked soul. God calls you. You can call yourself, I am brothers this, I am sister this. The moment you eat instructions, you eat the word of God. You don't want to hear the instructions of God's word. And you cast the word of God behind you. As you are hearing the word of God now, do you, do you push it to others and say, it is not for me, it is for that sister. It is not for me, it is for my husband. It is for my wife, it is for my children. You cast that word of God behind you. The Lord calls you the wicked. The world may call you a bishop. The world may call you a reverend. The world may call you a Christian, brother, so, 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 sister, so, so, a worker in the household of faith, but in the sight of the Almighty God, because you hate instruction, because you always cast the word of God you are hearing behind you. You say, that's not for me, that's not for me, that's not for me. The Lord says, you are the wicked. Look at it again in verse 18. What is sin? The description of sin. When thou seest a thief, then thou concert, concerted with him and hast been partakers with idolaters. You see a thief. You see there? Continue. When you are in agreement with those that disobey the word of God, the Lord calls you the wicked. Because you are in agreement with them. You agree to all their practices. You agree to all their doing. You might have a big title in the church. You might have a prominent position in the household of faith. In the sight of God and in heaven, the Lord sees you as the wicked, as the wicked, as the wicked. Because you're in agreement with them. And the Bible says, do and join hand to hand together. The wicked shall not do what? Shall not do unfunny. Sin. You know, brother, we need to understand what is sin in the context of not the society, but in the context of the Bible. And what I've been reading to you now, is it my own theory? It's the context of the word of God. When that con the things you watch on the internet, when you agree with all those things, you agree with them because that's why you watch them. Those polluting things. Those violent movies that you watch, those things that promote wickedness, violence, immorality, evil. The Bible says when you agree, you agree with them, that's why you watch them. You don't turn your eyes away from them. You don't turn the channels away. You don't turn the in, you don't go to another and say, okay, I cannot watch this. This is not for me. When you do that, God calls you the wicked. You need to repent of it. You need to repent of it. The thief, you join hand in hand. Let's do it together. Okay, I'm not doing it. You are the one doing it. And you are stealing by proxy. You are not the main thief, but you are the one stealing by proxy. The Lord calls you the wicked. People may not know, but God knows. There's an eye that watches. There's an eye that sees. In verse 17 of that same, verse 19, that giveth thy mouth to evil and thy tongue, framed deceit. Do you see the wicked there? Framed deceit. When you are deceptive, when you say A, but in your heart, what you mean is B. You are de that's deceptive, that's deception, and God calls you the wicked. When you are double tongue in your character, in your behavior, God calls you the wicked. 
In verse 20, thou sitest and speakest against thy brother. Thou sittest. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. I'm asking you, husband and wife, what do you discuss on dining table? You seated and speaketh against that brother, against that sister, in the fellowship of God's people. God calls you the wicked. Can you see the definition of the description of sin here, of wickedness? It is not enough that we just come to church, carry the Bible, and we say, okay, I'm a Christian. We need to understand the context, the description of sin. When thou seated and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thy own mother's son. You slander other people. You destroy other people's personality. You defame other people. You slander others. God calls you the wicked. Others may not call you wicked. Oh, yeah, 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 what you are doing is good. You are standing for holiness. But in your standing for holiness, you slander other people. God calls you the wicked. You are not standing for any holiness. You are righteous. You are unjust in the sight of God. These things that are done and I kept quiet. You can see there. And I kept silent. Thou oughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. But he says, I will reprove thee and set thee in order before thy heart. I pray we will not get there in Jesus' name. The description of sin. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Look at what he's saying here. Verse 23. And he that doubted is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever, whatsoever, whatsoever is not of faith. What did your Bible say? Is what? Whatsoever. My brother, whatever thing you are doing in the house of God, if it's not of faith, it's sin. It's sin. Whatever thing you are doing in your life, if it's not of faith, if you are living by feeling, the just, the Bible says, the just shall live by his faith. If you are no longer living by faith, you are a sinner. If the way you live now is by feeling, by the report of what you see in the society, by what you, you, you are living your life, by what others will say, not what God will say, but what others will say and approves all. The Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Faithlessness is sin. Faithlessness. When you don't have faith in God, everything you do now, I must work it out myself. I must do it my own way. I must do it and get the result myself. Not of faith, but of my strength. Not of God, but of my own power, my intelligence. Faithlessness is sin in the sight of God. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, the description of sin, verse 9. But if ye have respect to person, if ye have respect to person, ye do what? Ye commit sin. Respect. Yes, we respect others, we honor. Let me, put the, let me uh, get the context well for you. We respect others, we respect and honor our elders, our leaders, we respect them, we respect one another. But if you respect someone to disrespect God, then you sin, then you sin, then you sin. 
Because what does that entail? Oh, I, I respect my husband very well. Whatever he tells me, I will do. And what he's telling you is to disrespect the commandment of God. The Bible says that is sin in the sight of God. Sin in the sight of God. And are convinced of the law as transgressors. The Lord even knows you as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the old law and yet offend in one point is what? Is guilty of all. Are you beginning to get what is seen in the sight of God now? Do you have, are you getting understanding of what is seen before God now? You might keep the old law. The ten law of Moses. Oh, I've told you that Christ summarized this into two. You love God, number one. You love your neighbor, number two. But then your love for God is deceptive. Is deframed. Is distorted. You are guilty of one. You are guilty of four. You are guilty of all. What is sin? First John chapter 3, verse 4. First John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Sin, the law. The moral law, when you transgress that moral law, you sin against God. When you transgress the commandment, the doctrines of Christ, you sin against God. The doctrine, the teachings. You can't say you don't know the teachings of Christ. I just told you now, last Sunday service, the outline is there. Look at some of the, you've been reading your Bible. All Christ taught us in the New Testament. You might keep all the Old Testament law and you transgress just one. The Bible says, you are a sinner in the sight of God. Sin is the transgression. When you go contrary to the word of God, that's transgression. That's sin. The word of God says, a man will marry just one wife. And you, you say, well, I marry just one wife, and yet there's another woman outside that knows your secret, more than your wife. What is that? That's marriage now. You, may you might say, oh, she's not my wife. That's your wife. There's another woman outside that you find comfort with. You can talk with her. You can share with her all your mind. And you say, this woman is giving me just happiness. That's a wife. That's another wife you've married. And you've transgressed the command. Jesus said, I was sick and you visited me not. I was homeless and you visited me not. I was weak and you visited me not. I'm asking you, when last did you visit a brother in the church? As brothers to brothers? Or as a family to another family? When last did you go? Husband and wife, to go and visit that family. To go and visit that sister. You look, 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 look around us. You see people that come and people that don't come to church. When last did you visit them? Oh, you know, oh, Pastor, you know, this is UK. We are all so striving for pains and pounds. No time to visit. No time to check up on that border. No time to visit that sister. You transgress. You are transgressing the teachings of Christ. You are a sinner. In the sight of God. Because he taught us to love one another. As he has loved us. And part of our love is to make sacrifice for one another. When last do you make sacrifice for that brother? When last do you inconvenience yourself to make 
another brother, another sister happy? When last, I'm asking you, when last do you make yourself an answer to that brother's prayer, to that sister's prayer? They are transgressors of the law of God. That's it, the description of sin. Number two, the defilement through sinfulness. The defilement. We defy ourselves when we go into all these sins. Sin corrupts. Sin defies. Sin deforms. Sin defames. Sin defies. Let me show you this in Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 7. Then said I unto them, cast ye away every man the abomination of his eyes and defy not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. With the idols of... Can you see the defilement? They defy not yourself with the idols of Egypt, the pollutions of Egypt. Egypt, the corruptions of Egypt. For us today, the Egypt is the war, the war around us, the culture, the system, the traditions of the world. Defy not yourself. You defy yourself when you go into all those practices. That's why I say cast them off from your heart. The pollutions, the things you watch, the pollutions of Egypt that you watch, the things you spend your life and your mind on all the time, all the time. No time for Bible reading, no time for prayers, no time for scripture reading, no time for visitation, no time for service unto the Lord. You are just consumed and overwhelmed with all the pollutions, with all the corruptions, with all the defilements of Egypt. The Lord says, cast them away, cast them away. Then in, verse, in that thing, for I am the Lord. For I am the Lord. I pray every defilement of sinfulness, the Lord will cleanse us from them in Jesus' name. The defilement, look at the way Christ put it in Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. From verse 21 of Mark chapter 7. For from within, out of the heart of men, Proceed evil thoughts. The defilement. Things that come from within. Evil thoughts. Adulteries. Fornication. Murder. Do you see this? It's not until you carry knife that you commit murder. If that thought is in your heart, that's defilement. You are planning evil towards that brother. You are thinking of evil. What is witchcraft? You know, people always think that witchcraft is okay. It's when you just, okay, you are in a secret society. That's witchcraft as well, wizardry as well. But do you know that there is what we call the generational witchcraft that is on today? When you are witch hunting. Always looking for the fall of that brother. Always wishing for the fall of that sister. My brother, my sister, you are a witchcraft. You are a witch. When you don't think too much good of that brother, or you just think of for that sister, it's just, oh, I wish you will just backslide to the, you are a witch. You are a witch. It's not until you say, okay, uh, uh, I'm, I'm into a secret society. That's witchcraft. You're a wizard. He says there, thought, thefts. Look at verse 22, thefts. Covetousness, the library books you took that does not belong to you. That's stealing. The properties you are taking, you are flipping upon, that does not belong to you. That's stealing. Covetousness. The lost, the love, 
wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blaspheming, pride, foolishness. Look at what Christ says now in verse 23. All these evil things come from within. We may not see it. Well, I, the pastor may not know that you are planning evil towards the pastor, but God knows. That sister may not know that you are planning evil towards her, but God knows. Christ says, all those things that come from within, all those evil things, the evil thoughts, they, defi they, defi they are defiling. He says, all these evil things come from within and defy the man. I pray the Lord will cleanse us from every defilement in Jesus' name. And you know what? Sin also deadens. The deadness of sinners. Point three here, the deadness of sinners. If Ezekiel chapter 18, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, he shall what? He shall die. The soul that sinneth. And I've shown you the description of sin in accordance to the word of God. What is sin? The soul that sinneth, he shall die. The death is not just physical only. The death is also spiritual. It shall die physically. Many lives have been lost. Many lives have been cut short because of sinfulness. Many lives have not been fulfilled on earth because of iniquity. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. It shall die physically, it shall die spiritually. It shall die here on earth, and it shall die eternally in hell. There is eternal death for all sinners. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. The wages. The payment of sin. The consequences of sinning is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. James chapter 1, verse 14. James chapter 1, verse 14. And every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. There is eternal death at the end of a sinful life. That's why the Lord is warning us today. Don't go into sin. Sin corrupts. Sin pollutes. Sin defies. I pray the Lord will cleanse us from all sin today in Jesus' name. Point two quickly, divine provision of our sin offering. The Lord has made provision to deliver us from sin, from the power of sin, from the defilement of sin. He has made the provision. You see that from, from Numbers chapter 15, verses 25 to 29. You see, the, I, the priests there had to make the atonement for the sin of ignorance committed by any individual. As he, comes to the off, as he comes to the congregation, he must bring the offering. And as he brings that offering, the priests had to make the atonement. The same thing. Christ has provided all we need for our redemption, for our forgiveness, because he is our sin offering. Three things we consider here quickly. Number one, we see the promise of God's sacrificial lamb. The promise of God's sacrificial lamb. Number two, we see the provision 
of gracious salvation through the Lamb. The provision of grace of gracious salvation through the Lamb. And lastly, we'll see the partakers of godliness and sanctification through the Lamb. The partakers, I pray you'll be a partaker. This provision of God will not be wasted in your life in Jesus' name. Let's go straight to point one here. The promise of God's sacrificial lamb. When man, when man sinned at the Garden of Eden, God made the promise in Genesis chapter 3 of the sacrificial lamb, of his provision for our salvation. And then in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, he says, Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And shall call his name Emmanuel. That's the promise of our sacrificial lamb. Matthew, look at the fulfillment of that promise now of that prophecy of our sacrificial lamb. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. That was the promise. That was the fulfillment of that promise through the Virgin Mary. She shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. And when that son was born, and after, his, you know, after uh, some years, he went into public, he started his public ministry. At the beginning of his public ministry, John the Baptist, he saw him in John chapter 1, verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day, John said Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God. That promise has been fulfilled. That promise has been realized. The promise of God's sacrificial lamb through our Lord Jesus Christ. It came in fulfillment of the prophecy and the promise of God. Can I tell you today? Every good promises of God concerning your life. Every good promises of God concerning your family. Every good promises of God concerning your present circumstances and situation. Everything will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Can I hear a louder? Amen. Have faith in God and all these good promises in your life. All these good promises towards you that will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. No, he saw the lamp of God. He said, Behold the lamp of God, the lamp of God which taketh away the sin of the old world. Number two here, the provision. The promise has been fulfilled, but look at this now the provision of gracious salvation through the lamb. Gracious salvation. If you go back again to our text where we've read Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15, verse 25. And the priest shall make an atonement. He will make the sacrifice. He will make the offering for their atonement, for their forgiveness, for their salvation. The provision of God's gracious salvation through the Lamb. Our God is plenteous, plenteous, plenteous. He is the God with him. We have plenteous redemption. As the priest was to make atonement for the offender, for the one that Israel open door, for with the blood there is mercy. With our God there is mercy. My brother, no matter how far you have gone, with our God there is forgiveness. 
with our God, there is mercy, there is redemption, there is gracious salvation with our God. Hope in God, put your trust in God, put your faith in God, and He will save you. No matter how big your sins are, the grace of God will reach you at the biggest of all those sins in this world today. He will come and save you. I say our God will come and save you. He says in verse 8, and you shall redeem Israel from all iniquity. He will redeem you. He will save you. He will restore you unto his salvation. He will forgive your sin. He will cleanse you from all your sin. Amen. See, this is the one you need to learn trust to. If you come to the Lord today, it is to cleanse now. Not to go into that sin again. The Lord will forgive you. He will forgive and he will cleanse you from all those sins in this world today. But this is the most important chapter he says in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 of Acts chapter 3. He tells you therefore, stand ye converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Your sins may be blotted out. All the unrighteousness of sins in your life. If you repent today in assurance of the word of God, all your sins will be blotted out. All your sins will be forgiven. All your sins will be cleansed. He says, and that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. May we see that times of refreshing in this world today. Verse 20 says, unto me, God. He says, unto me, my God. Unto me, God. Everybody say, unto me, God. Say it louder. Unto me, God. You were saved that today in Jesus' name. Unto you, God, God, having raised up his son, his son, his son, the provision of God to save the life of your his son. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except the name Jesus. There is no salvation in any other. There is no forgiveness in any other. It is only through the Son of God we receive the forgiveness of our sin. He says, unto you, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you. Who is the Lord blessing today? Who is the Lord blessing today? He will bless you with his salvation. He will bless you with his forgiveness. He will bless you with his redemption. He will bless you. He says to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. The Lord will turn you away from your iniquities in Jesus' name. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will wash you. Your sin. Paul John chapter 2 verse 1. Now listen carefully. This thing Christ I unto you that ye sin not. That Christians do not commit sin as Christians because he says that you sin not. The grace of God is supposed to keep us from sinning. A sinner is not a Christian and a Christian is not a sinner. That you sin not. That's the teaching of the word of God. Can anybody come in to me today and say, well, you can be a Christian and you can still continue in your sin. God understand. Please, my brother, run away from that person. No matter his title. No matter his position in the world. Run away. Because everyone that encourages you to continue sinning is leading you in the pathway to hell fire. But you, you will not listen to them. I say you, you will not listen to them. You will not watch their video. You will not support their ministry. That you see not, that is the teaching of the word of God. If you're a Christian, that you see not. And I've been able to describe every Bible verse to you. 
that you do know the things are better and if only they are true. Are you listening to me? If they are true, or by faith or without faith, if only they are true, you are right. I think it's true. You are right. You see, Again, I do not know the definition of the truth that we call it no matter how bad you may think you are in the world of this according to the position of the Bible I don't know what you do you see again if only my skin you are happy if you are good already what is good that you are good in already you the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, lives in propitiation, his offering, a substitute for our sins, the sacrificial lamb for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. I gave the interpretation to the Old Testament. That's how sad the rich came, and I gave the true story, the story. We recognize this truth there as the Father, the Son of the living God, as God manifested in the flesh, loving us and dying for our redemption. And we is so accepted by a fellow of the Lord of this incarnate God as to be constrained to make the gift of Christ the rule of his obedience and the glory of Christ to go on for you to live. I gave that even to you. Yes, the scripture. You will partake of this transition of glory in your spirit. Point three here, the partakers of his godliness and sanctification through the Lamb. Christ did not only die to save us from sin, he also died, he paid the price so that we can partake of his godliness, so that the image, the original image of God that was lost in the garden might be restored unto us again. That's why he paid the price. That's why he shed his blood on the cross at Calvary. So that you, my brother, so that you, my sister, is not enough to say, I am born again. I'm asking you, are you a partaker of his godliness? Of his godliness. Are you a partaker of this second work of grace, sanctification? The righteousness of God implanted and imputed unto you. The grace, the holiness of God. Are you a particular? That's what the Lord is calling us to today. And I pray we will partake in this in Jesus' name. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the word by the word, the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, a glorious church. You will be a partaker of that glorious church in Jesus' name. He wants you to be part of that glorious church. He wants you to be part of that holy church. He wants you to be part of that righteous church. He wants you to be a partaker of his holiness. He says that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy. We will be holy. Tell your neighbor, you will be holy. Say it now, you, you will be holy. That he should be holy and without blemish. This the Lord will do in our lives in Jesus' name. 
In Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. He might redeem us, that's number one, from all iniquity. Number two, purify unto himself. He wants to purify you today. Are you born again? The Lord wants to purify you today. Purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The Lord will do this for you in Jesus' name. My brother, don't despise the full provision of Christ for you on the cross of Calvary. He died on the cross to save you from sin. He died on the cross so that you can partake in his gracious salvation. That salvation of your soul, salvation even of your body, that anywhere there is sickness, anywhere there is any disease, as you come to the Lord today, the Lord will heal you. The Lord will, you know, it will Take away all those sicknesses, all those diseases away in Jesus' name. But then, to also sanctify you. That's why purify unto himself a peculiar people. You will be part of that peculiar people. I say you, you will be part of that peculiar people. Zealous of good works. This the Lord will do in our lives in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own Lord, suffered without the gift. He suffered without the gift. Not only to save you from sin, not only to heal you of all your sicknesses, but also to sanctify you and make you holy and make you righteous. Be a partaker today. And how can you be a partaker? No, he has prayed for you. John chapter 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And every prayer of Jesus for you, for this sanctification, the Lord will answer today in Jesus' name. He has prayed for you. You receive that prayer. And how can you come to receive this experience? You come before the Lord, lay your life on the earth or the altar, sanctify yourself, you consecrate yourself unto the Lord, turn away from everything unclean, and present yourself as a living sacrifice, like we are told in Romans chapter 12, unto the Lord. And then you pray, pray by faith, purifying their heart, Hebrews chapter 15 verse 9, purifying their heart by faith. As you ask the Lord, it will answer you. It will make you holy. It will make you righteous. It will make you pure in Jesus' name. But if we see all these things, we've read all these things, we've known all these things, if we not despise the word of God, we not despise the commandment of God, what will happen to us? I pray this will not happen to you in Jesus' name. This leads me to point three, but I still need to teach you the whole Bible. Point three here, damnation, the damnation and the punishment for all sinners. You see that in, in Numbers chapter 15, verses 30 to 31, verses 35 to 36. Three things we see here. Number one, warning against impenitent sin. The warning. Number two, we look at the wailings. If you we are warned, and you despise the warning, then there will be the wailing of the insolate sinners. The insolate sinners. And lastly, so that we will not be there, there must be the watchfulness against iniquities as sins. The watchfulness against iniquity as sins. We are warned. We are warned in the old Bible. In fact, when Christ was here or not, he warned us against impenitent sin. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. Whos and whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever, presumptuous sin, willful sin, speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this war, neither in the war to come. Warning, presumption sin, 
the Lord wants against it. We for sinning, the Lord wants against it. Deliberate sinning consciously, you are just falling into that sin over and over and over and over again. The Lord wants against it. Be careful, my brother. Be careful, my sister. Don't take God for granted. Don't think, oh, where well, there is no judgment of sin again today. There is still, God still judges sin today. He still judges sin today. Many years ago, young people, they were in the, you know, in this uh, crusade meeting of this man, Charles Spurgeon. Many years, here in England, in the United Kingdom, and Charles Spurgeon gave them the altar call after his message, come to Jesus, Come to Jesus, look and live. And this young man, they make jest of the message. They make mockery of Charles Spurgeon. Do you know that same night, that same night after the crusade, the revival meeting in the night, they were on their way going. And all of them, the young people, the young people there, they were all crushed to death. Morning. God, be careful. Don't take God for granted. There was a story of this of 80s. He was smoking and he smoked and he, and he smoked and he was he said, well, and he pop it up to God and say, Well, God, this is for you. Immediately he was consumed. Be careful. God still judges sin. Warning. He says there, yeah, be careful. Christ warned us. That's why we are told in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, you know it is evil, and you sin willfully, you go deliberately into it. I don't know many people that are caught up with HIV because they go deliberately into that sin of immorality. I know of an individual who went into that sin, and he caught up with that sin of HIV AIDS, and he died as a result of that. Be careful. Be careful. Don't take God for granted. If we sin willfully, after we have received, we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remained no more sacrifice for sin. That's the warning. I pray we will take heed to that warning in Jesus' name. But if you don't take heed, and you continue in that deliberate sin. What is the end of that sinful life? Point two here, the wailings, the cry, the torments of insolate sinners, willful sinners, adding sinners, sinners that is or incorrigible sinners. Psalm 9, verse 7. The wicked shall be torn into hell, and all the nations that forget God. All the nations. Pastor, is it possible for God to cast all the nations into hell? Ah, it's possible. He did it for Sodom and Gomorrah. Those nations, he destroyed them with fire from heaven. It's possible. It's possible he did it at the time of Noah. Of Noah. Noah. Only, only Noah and his families, eight of them, were saved from the judgment of the flood. And every other woman being perish in the flood. It's possible. All the nations shall be torn into hell that forgets God. Where is hell? What is hell? How does hell look like? Hebrew, uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. These are messages you don't hear everywhere, but we need to teach you the Bible. We need to teach you the word of God. We need to teach you the commandment of the Lord. This in verse 10 of Revelation chapter 14. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. 
and it shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended all forever and ever, and they shall have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. I pray that will not be you in Jesus' name. Hell is real. Tell your friends. Tell your children. Tell your husband. Tell your wife. The consequences of a sinful life. The end of a sinful life is a fire. People say, well, God is love, God is merciful. Yes, God is merciful, but the soul that sinned, it shall die. There is judgment. There is wailing. There is torment in hell that awaits all sinners. I pray you will not be there in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful, the fearful, you are afraid to give your life to Christ. And the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and all mongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I pray you will not end up in hell. So that you will not end up in hell, then this point three is very important before we pray. Watchfulness against iniquities are sins. We must watch. We must guide our lives. I've shown you the description of sin now. You go back home. You begin to watch your life against all these things so that these things will not be in your life. Watchfulness. That's why the psalmist prayed in Psalm 19, verse 12, who can understand his error? Cleanse thou me from secret fault. Keep back. That should be your prayer every day, my brother. That should be your prayer in the time of temptation, in the time of trials, in the time when your husband is not there, at the time when your wife is not there, at the time when your parents are not there with you. Keep back thy servants also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over. That should be our prayer every day. It's not enough to ask God, give me job, give me money, give me this, give me properties. What shall it profit a man if you gain the old world? You have all the properties you need to have in Aberdeen. You have all the houses you need to have in the UK. You have all the good jobs you need to have in the UK. What shall it profit you? You have all the cars. You have all the shares. You have all the money sitting in your savings account. What shall it profit you if you gain the old world and lose your own soul? The greatest prayer we should be praying every day, watchfulness against iniquity are saying, is that, Lord, let not presumptuous sin, let not, you know, ignorance sin, let not the sin of omission, the sin of carelessness, let them not have dominion over me, that I shall be upright. In the day, I will be upright. In the night, I will be upright. When others are there, I will be upright. When others are not there, I will be upright. And I shall be innocent from the great transgressions. I pray that will be our prayers in Jesus' name. That will be your own prayer today. You will pray it. You will spend time to pray. Keep me, Lord, so that sin will not have iniquity, will not have dominion over me. The same thing we are told in Romans chapter 6. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Let it not reign. Watch against it. Watch against that a little carelessness. 
Little sinfulness, watch against it. Let no sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lost thereof. That's why it says for, in verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Say it for yourself. For sin shall not have dominion over me. Say it again. Say it with faith and confidence. Stand up, lift up your Bible. Stand up, stand up, lift up your Bible. And you say it. For sin shall not have dominion over me. Say it again. For sin shall not have dominion over me. Say it again. For sin shall not have dominion over me. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayers. The sacrifice of Christ has been made. He shed his blood so that we can be saved from sin. He paid the price so that we will be redeemed from sin. Pray and ask the Lord today, Lord, keep me from sin. Sin will not have dominion over me. Iniquity will not have victory over me. will not have hold over me. Pray and talk to the Lord. We've seen what sin is, the description and the pollution of sin. You've seen the description of sin. Examine yourself. Search your life. Is there any sin that the sin of wrongdoings, transgression, that sin when you transgress, when you don't observe the commandment of God, that is sin? Talk to the Lord and pray. You've seen the defilement through sinfulness. Sin defies. It corrupts the mind. Every corruption, lay them before the Lord today. Cleanse me from every secret fault, every defilement of sin. Lord, cleanse me. The Lord will cleanse you. The Lord will wash you. Talk to the Lord. We've seen that sin, the soul that sinned, he shall die. He shall die. You don't want to die. Talk to the Lord. The Lord will save you. The Lord will save you. There is provision, divine provision for our, of our sin offering. Jesus is that provision. The unblemished lamp of God for our cleansing and our forgiveness. Talk to the Lord. We've seen the promise of God's sacrificial lamp. That promise has been fulfilled. It has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray. Receive that fulfillment of his promise in your life. He paid the price. He provides for your gracious salvation. Through the, through the Lamb, receive the provision of his salvation today. Receive the provision of his forgiveness today. Receive the provision of his redemption today. Receive the provision of his cleansing today. He will cleanse you from all sin. But you need to repent. You need to turn away from sin. Talk to the Lord. The Lord will forgive you. He will see, be partaker when he forgives, partake of his holiness, of his good, of his godliness, and of his sanctification. Talk to the Lord, offer yourself as a living sacrifice unto the Lord and receive of his forgiveness today. Pray and talk to the Lord. We have been warned against impenitent sin. My brother, don't joke with sin. My sister, don't joke with sin. With the wailing, the end of a sinful life, you see, air fire. Pray that the Lord himself will help you. You will not spend eternity in air fire. That's why our Father and the Lord told us, and I quote, Jesus Christ, he made the provision for the salvation of everyone. But everyone still has a personal responsibility to come to him, turn from sin. And believe in the Lord. Believe in the Lord. Turn away from your sin today. Sin will not have dominion over you. Pray and ask for grace that the Lord will give you that grace. You live a gracious life, a holy life, so that sin will not have dominion over you.
taking the message, uh, the diagnosis has come, the medicine has come, has not left for you to take in the medication of the word of God. He has sent his word. The word is ready to heal you if you take it in. And I pray we will experience the healing in our lives in Jesus' name. Almighty God in heaven, we thank you for the word, the revelations you have sent to us. We have seen that the Holy Ghost has come through the church. And he has brewed, he has seen everywhere. He has seen the diagnosis. Each individual here, you can see where you are sick. You have seen the sickness. And Lord, we come together as a church. As the pastor has prayed, we acknowledge our sin and our transgressions. And we pray that we come in humility. Lord, we confess our sin and we ask you, the blood who of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that was shed for us for the remission for our sin. As the pastor has prayed at the beginning of the message, effectual, that blood will work effectually. And um, right now, blot out every sin, every transgression in our lives in Jesus' name. All the accusers of the brethren, the Satan has been cast out. Today, we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And Lord, and sin shall not have dominion over anyone here any longer in Jesus' name. Lord, we receive the power. We receive the strength. We receive the grace. We receive the anointing to overcome sin in Jesus' name. O God of heaven, we pray. The choir they sang at the beginning that sinner will not enter there. Lord, we know our friends, the rich man is in hell. We know our friends, Aquila and Priscilla, they are in hell. We know Lot and Lot's wife is in hell. We know some of our friends, they are in hell, the rich man. Lord of hosts, the choir, the sign says, sinner will not enter there. Lord, we pray. We don't want the sin, maybe little, maybe small, big, whatever size, whatever shape, whatever form, to hinder us from entering into that glorious home, into that beautiful home. Lord, we pray that from today onward, Lord, we continue to journey to that heavenly home, and sin and Satan will lose their hold and their grip on anyone here, both great and small here, our children, our youth. Lord, sin will not hinder us from getting to that glorious home in Jesus' name. Mighty God today, as we go, we pray your presence continue to go with us. And make us holiness unto you, families, individuals, as a church. And let your name be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Thank you. God bless you. We have come to the end of the service.